Hello everyone, I'm Jason Wyke of WRHU's Morning Wake Up Call. Today I am joined by the renowned Dr. Eduardo Duarte to talk about his public lecture for the Center for Race, Culture, and Social Justice. This area is located in 203 Roosevelt Hall with their director, Dr. Jonathan Lightfoot, and associate director, Dr. Veronica Lippincott. His lecture will take place on Tuesday, February 14th from 2.40 to 4.05. This lecture is a result of the work that made you a, recip a recipient of the Faculty Summer Research Grant. So to start us off, could you tell the listeners about how you were able to do the work that led to this honor? Well, thanks for having me on. Um, well, first I want to acknowledge that I'm here in WRHU, Studio North, where I have recorded many, many dead zones because not only am I uh, Professor Eduardo Duarte, but I'm also Professor Iguana, host of The Dead Zone here on WRHU, Sundays 6 to 8 p.m. EST. And so the reason I'm bringing that up is because this project that I'm going to be presenting uh, through W.E.B. Du Bois actually has a long history. It goes back to the work I've been doing in part here at WRHU on The Dead Zone, a project that I generally call cultural education through music. Uh, in some ways, you could say it's a countercultural educational project because I'm sort of exploring the alternative ways that we can think about who we are as a community, specifically who we are as Americans. And so, of course, Du Bois is posing that challenge to us. He's posing the challenge in a book that is actually 120 years old in one day on the day that we're recording this. He finished it on February the 1st. 1903. And so I've been working on this project for quite a while. That is to say the relationship between uh, music and cultural education. You know, how does music form us? How does music inform us? How does music reveal things about who we are, both as individuals, as a community? How does music uh, present itself in a therapeutic way, as a kind of healing how does music present itself in a spiritual way? And that's very much related to Du Bois. His uh, op uh, magnum opus that I'll be presenting on is called The Souls of Black Folk. So there's an important spiritual component to that work. And also, how is music prophetic? Again, that's also something that I take up in Du Bois. So when he asked the general question, how did I get into this project? Well, I've been in it for a while. I, I feel like I've been doing this project my whole life because I've been sort of captivated by music. Uh, my entire life. But this specific talk that I'll be giving on Valentine's Day um, is the result of research that I have been doing and have been getting support from the Center for Race, Culture, and Social Justice. And the title of the paper is W.E.B. Du Bois and the Aesthetic Education Offered by Music. So one of the main pieces that you'll be talking about in there is The Souls of Black Folk, as you just mentioned, by W.E.B. Du Bois. And this is considered to be one of the most important pieces in African-American history. So why do you think that this work was able to gain so much traction and why it is so monumental? Well, it's interesting um, that you should ask that because at the time um, that Du Bois – well, Du Bois, the work itself is a collection of essays that Du Bois uh, had written – in the 1890s. And so if you sort of go back in your uh, memory and, you know, sort of like a historical thinking cap, you put that on, um, just imagine what America was like in, during Reconstruction, right? Um, the sort of promise and hope and then to a certain degree, the failure of Reconstruction, right? So a lot of Du Bois essays in the 1890s um, are, are exploring both a hope, but also sort of like a, a, a hard look at the failures of Reconstruction, specifically a lot of the violence um, that had been uh, imposed in the South um, on uh, uh, African Americans, specifically um, lynching and other ways of, of suppressing and oppressing um, through violent means often. And so Du Bois is reflecting on that and writing that, and his counterpart at the time was someone that you probably recall was Booker T. Washington. And he had become very famous um, by sort of encouraging this notion um, that black folks should sort of, you know, get practical education and should commit themselves to business enterprises. And he was getting a lot of support from the sort of status quo, um, from the, the status quo white uh, community, white power brokers. And so Du Bois in some ways is responding to that. And for many, his work, The Souls of Black Folk, 
uh, was a sort of correction and, and an important positive alternative to the vision that was offered by Booker T. Washington. Because for Du Bois, he took seriously uh, the possibilities of education that was, we would argue, in, in coming through the liberal arts, perhaps. We could describe it that way. A university that was built upon uh, the arts, upon the liberal arts, upon thinking. He's very much influenced by the education he received, not only at Harvard, but his time that he spent at the University of Berlin. And when the war came out, it was sort of a, an immediate sort of sensation, and it was, you know, criticized by those white power brokers that I mentioned earlier that were sort of behind Booker T. Washington's vision, but very much taken up by the black community. And um, even though Du Bois later sort of revised some of his thinking, which I'll be talking a little bit about uh, in my presentation, he it's, this was like the, the beginning of a very important uh, career that Du Bois had. Um, for the next uh, uh, 60 uh, um, uh, uh, some years. So the work is framed like music. Can you explain to those who haven't read it how this book would read and, and what that means? So that's, yeah, so that's the heart of, of the sort of the thesis. Um, when you pick up the book, uh, The Souls of Black Folk, um, before each chapter as an epigraph are um, l lines of poetry by European poets, actually, um, and bars of music, right? And the bars of music come from important spirituals. And what Du Bois uh, is trying to do there, I would argue, and that's kind of the heart of my paper, is to sort of frame our reading. So as, it's almost like a, um, a, you're walking through a threshold, a musical threshold, and there's, there's like a soundtrack, if you will, to each chapter and to the whole book. So just imagine as you're, so there's a, there's a lot of things going on there. One you could argue is a sort of proto uh, uh, sort of soundtrack cinematography sort of thing, right? So if you think about how film took on sound and music became so important in film, there's a way in which the souls of black folk in 1903 is already anticipating this notion of a soundtrack. So one way to think about it is, is as a soundtrack. The other way to think about it is that he is presenting before each chapter important examples of the sort of genius of the African-American spirit, right? So the, the soul of, of, of black folks um, is very much expressed through these spirituals. Now, you probably know the spirituals come out of a tradition that began on the plantation, right? It's the songs of, of slaves, right? It's their way of, of, of reaffirming and emphasizing and expressing their humanity, right? It's There's a lot more to it, of course, uh, than that, but that's at the core of it, is the sense of um, expressing of one's humanity. So Du Bois, by placing this music before each chapter, is allowing us, uh, the book, to resound with the spirit and the soul of African-American humanity, the claim of their humanity, and he's sort of of compelling his readers to hear that expression of humanity, to hear that expression of um, um, the the exclamation of freedom, right, and and the joy and the promise that's to come with freedom. So that's uh, an important sort of notion of of why the music is placed in each chapter. He's also teaching us of the, I would argue. Um, the importance of taking seriously the arts as a way of thinking about uh, the human experience, right? So he had um, a very strong background in social science. He was he taught economics when he was at Atlanta University, where he was when he uh, published this work, The Souls of Black Folk. He also taught history, but he realized that there you couldn't tell the truth, quote unquote, solely by science or social science. The arts had a prominent role to play in revealing and illuminating the truth, the truth of the human experience. So I think that by placing music and poetry at the beginning of each chapter, he's really emphasizing the power of the arts. And I, I'm going to argue that for him, the arts are most powerful and actually more powerful than science. So you discuss the importance of you know, that, that expression and the human experience. And in your research, you talk about aesthetic education offered by music. So how would this differ from standard education? That's a great question. So aesthetic education has this sort of long tradition. And in fact, one of the uh, uh, folks that he quotes in uh, The Souls of Black Folk, one of, one of the epigraphs comes from uh, uh, Schiller, who was an important German romantic thinker and also um, an educational sort of reformer. He founded the uh, University of Berlin. 
And Schiller was known um, for presenting this notion of aesthetic education as um, a reason being uh, um, sort of developed through the emotion. So the relationship between reasoning, if you will, rationality and the emotion. So the arts help us um, sort of form into uh, a, a kind of person that has an, a sensibility that is balanced with the emotional side and the rational side. Now, so an aesthetic education really is, it's, it's a complicated endeavor um, because it presumes that when we are interacting or experiencing, it's better to put it as an experiencing, works of art, such as music, but not only music, dance, arts, literature, poetry. When we have the aesthetic experience, there is some kind of transformation that is possible. Right? And so an aesthetic education presumes that the human person um, is more whole or more complete when they've encountered the arts. Why? Because the arts, those of us that are into aesthetic education would argue, are the highest form of human expression. Why is that? Because it comes from our capacity to create. It comes from our ability to be free. So human freedom and human creativity if you are, if you understand this is at the at the core of who we are as humans so to become more fully human one has to experience the arts so an aesthetic education if we can be so audacious and bold as to say it really is about completing the formation of our human being it also connects us to one another um, when I'm encountering a work of art I'm not simply encountering the work of art I'm also encountering the artist the person who who created that or who is creating it or the people that are creating it in the case of let's say a jazz ensemble or a symphony or a dance troupe or a theater troupe right i'm connecting with their humanity and so we're collectively sort of coming together as human beings we're also connecting with the past insofar as what we are uh, experiencing is something that has been created and is an expression of a past time a past moment so we kind of get a cultural education, a sort of straightforward way of learning more about some kind of historical event, some period in time. And then lastly, an aesthetic education is also sort of projecting us towards the future. Because the argument is that the work of art is something that is the result of something that's new. It's, it's, the, it's the product of our ability to create and to make new things. And that sort of inspires us to think towards the future as something that could be different than the past or even the present. So the aesthetic education sort of includes all of those things, and there's a lot that we can really explore when we think about how the arts forms us both as individuals and the community. Well, I certainly would like to explore the topic deeper, and I, I definitely think I'll be attending the lecture. So in, in looking into uh, your background, I saw you also have some other philosophical research. So I was curious if that was able to tie into this lecture at all, some of the other separate topics as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I appreciate that question because uh, one of the things I'm going to do in the lecture is I'm going to pivot um, to some of the work that I've been doing for a long time on listening. And so uh, Du Bois doesn't do a whole lot with listening. I mean, you could argue he presumes that his reader um, can listen to music or is able to listen. But listening is a complicated phenomenon. It's different than hearing. You know, listening is a much deeper sense of receiving that which is arriving to us in sound. So it's a sonic experience, but it's also, as I will argue, through the work of the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, Listening involves our sort of setting aside our own sort of ego, our own identity, and just letting the sound and the music sort of permeate us. So I'm going to be focusing a lot on my research on the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy as a way of deepening my ex exploration and the work I've been doing on Du Bois on the aesthetic education. Because you really can't have an aesthetic education through music if you don't understand um, what listening is about and the kind of listening that will allow us to have a deep aesthetic experience. So I'll be looking at that and exploring that and bringing that part of my research into the presentation. So it's quite obvious you have a passion for music. Where did this passion come from? That's a great question. You know, I mean, I think for a lot of people, it just arrived in the household. You know, there was music all around. Um, I was the youngest of a family of four kids, two parents. And music, I was just from the young age always sort of hearing music, right? My father was a, I think he was a member of like the Columbia Record Club, and we're going way back now. And so he had a large stack of records, constantly playing that. And then I had older sisters. 
I grew up in the groovy 70s. Um, this is back in the day, the great days of vinyl, the great albums that came out. And so there was just music everywhere. At one point, you could walk into our house and hear music being played all over the house. Something that actually Ralph Ellison, another important African-American thinker, as we celebrate this month of African-American History Month, Ralph Ellison uh, writes about the experience of hearing music everywhere in this apartment that he's living in and then finally going out and buying a, fo- a record player that was really powerful so that he could like <laughs> blast over the others. So this is not uncommon for someone, you know, sort of my age to have grown up in a house full of music. But I have always had a deep connection to music in terms of wanting to play it. So at a very young age, I, I took to drumming. And, um, you know, I sort of tapped into our Dominican heritage. My parents are from the Dominican Republic. And I got a tambora and I was playing that. And then I got a drum set. And then like a lot of high school kids at the time, I was in a garage band. And then I just have always been playing and listening to music and then saw many, 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 many uh, live concerts. And so music has just always been a central part of my um, sort of life, I guess you would say. And it's just been something that I've always been inspired by. I can't imagine a life without music. I've seen any every possible type of music you could imagine, and I'm always seeking out this this sort of like uh, uh, apex moment of live musical performance. That's something I'm in search of, and that's what brought me over here to WRHU well over 20 years ago and sort of is one of the reasons that I continue to uh, produce The Dead Zone every Sunday um, here at WRHU. So music is... You really hit on all the important areas. It's sort of like my philosophical work on listening, this project on Du Bois, and then my passion for music. It's all sort of coming together. And, you know, I've been a professor here for over uh, 25 years, and I feel as energized, if not more energized, in this semester, in the beginning of this semester, than I have ever, uh, in part because of the overlap of these different projects. And to be talking about this here in Studio North is just... Uh, it's just a really cool uh, coincidence, I guess, a happy coincidence, you could say, yeah. Your excitement is absolutely radiating. I- I'm sad that we only have a certain amount of time, but you know, we're getting towards the end here, and I was curious, with Black History Month just starting the other day, are there any other figures in black history you have researched or have a particular connection with besides Du Bois? Yeah, there's so many. I mean, I would, you know, Du Bois is, is, is central, but, um, you know, as I mentioned, Ralph Ellison, um, but the musicians, you know, I mean, I'm deeply influenced by blues and jazz. In fact, I'm teaching a course right now in, on W.E.B. Du Bois, and the, the project that I'm presenting is also happening as a course. And that, and so the course will be looking at, um, you know, Du Bois' invitation that we sort of listen to the spirituals to listen for, quote unquote, who we are as Americans, sort of posing that as a question, and then tracing the development of African-American music from the spirituals to the blues and jazz. So I have, like, I'm inspired by so many uh, blues musicians, you know, from Ma Rainey, uh, Howling Wolf, B.B. King, and then a very deep connection to many jazz musicians, particularly Miles Davis, Ornette Coleman, and John Coltrane. Um, those are sort of my, my musical heroes, and I've, I've done a ton of work on them as well and done a couple papers on Coltrane's influence on the Grateful Dead, for example. So it's it's mostly in the world of the arts and specifically music. But, you know, just sort of one of the one of the professors out there, Cornell West, you may have heard of him, and he really inspired me when I was in graduate school um, to sort of keep on keeping on. You know, academia can be a, a, a tough sled, and uh, Cornell West was someone that I had met early on in my graduate career and sort of inspired me to uh, to continue on. So there are so many, um, but I just want to just focus on those musicians and uh, some of the artists that really inspired me, yeah. Are there any closing notes you'd like to uh, discuss before we wrap up? No, like I said, it's just really a, 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 a cool treat to be here in, in, in Studio North. Um, I have to say, like, I, I arrest in power Bruce Avery, you know, I mean, our, our beloved leader uh, who recently passed away. I uh, want to and also want to thank Jonathan and Veronica for their support um, for making this project uh, move forward. And I'm really excited for this presentation. So on Valentine's Day, come on out to uh, hear my presentation. <laughs> Absolutely. And then uh, how can our audience reach you if they have any other further questions? Oh, yeah. You can find me on the, the Hofstra portal, I believe. You can email me um, if you find my email. It's at eduardo.m.duarte at hofstra.edu. Um, and that's that's the best way to reach me. 
Thank you so much for joining me. And for anyone who wishes to attend the public lecture, it will take place on Tuesday, February 14th from 2.40 to 4.05 in the Multipurpose Room West in the Mac Student Center. And the event will be free and open to the public, but advanced registration is required. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I'm Jason Wyke of Morning Wake Up Call. Back to the studio.